Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel wherever you are in the world and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much. So we're on part two of our story and there's a woman who thinks she's in a hospital bed and she believes um, that she's had some kind of surgical procedure or operation. So that's what it opens up to, that she's trying to get through this amnesia, trying to get through this feeling of being caught under an anaesthetic and you're trying to wake up but you can't, almost as if you're in a coma. And so it starts off like that and then we go back in time and we learn about how she got a job, a promotion at Centrefile, where she was going to be office manager. Her name is June Jones, so let's continue with our story. I couldn't believe I'd been selected to be the new office manager. I was thrilled at the opportunity the job presented for me. But no one could believe my good news when I emerged from my rendezvous with Mr Bridges with a huge smile on my face. I cheekily said to my office colleagues in an unbridled new confidence, Meet your new office manager! To which everyone cheered and applauded and clapped their hands. When I phoned my mother to tell her of my accomplishments, she informed me that she was not remotely surprised. What did I tell you, love? I knew you could do it. So now you've had a much-deserved upgrade. I do hope you're going to get that luxurious apartment overlooking the Space Needle that you've been wanting so much. Grab the bull by the horns and do it now, love. Don't delay. I didn't need much encouragement. I was happy to leave my nondescript apartment behind and give my notice of rent to my landlord. My old apartment was situated above a deli in Capitol Hill. I met the real estate agent for the block of apartments I had been dreaming about renting for a very long time. The agent's name was Mrs. Jenna Armstrong, a blonde svelte woman who was tall like a giraffe. She wore smart bell-bottomed white pants and a matching jacket with a blue and white scarf that was coiled around her swan-like neck. Everything about this woman was long and lean. Hello, she said, in a chirpy professionalism, taking my hand in hers and squeezing it so tightly that I winced in pain. Was this big woman aware of her own strength? Probably not. Pleased to meet you. You must be Miss Jones, she said, looking down at me, as if I was a tiny little thing. But then again, everybody would be small in this woman's presence. With very little difficulty, I might add. Well, Miss Jones, I'm delighted to show you around this exclusive apartment today, with its exquisite views over the Space Needle. I'm sure you will agree about that. You can see it's situated in a beautiful street, with lots of mature trees swaddling the pavement. The rental costs might appear expensive, but where do you get views so panoramic like this? she said, lifting her arms to salute the sparkling floor-to-ceiling glass windows, where the leafy green of the trees on the pavement and the soft sunshine filtered through the apartment. I could see a man with his two black Maltese poodles walking down the street, and yet he would never have seen me. The apartment brought the outside in. In my experience, Miss Jones, nothing ever beats a good view. But then again, you have to pay for it. It is magnificent, I admitted. This is a highly sought-after location, Miss Jones, but then I'm sure you're very aware of that. You get what you pay for in an idyllic neighbourhood like this that is very much sought after and in high demand. The apartments in this location have a much fiercer price tag, I'm afraid. I appreciate all that, I said. Furthermore, continued Mrs Armstrong, the convenience is a huge plus-plus for people living in these apartments. You're close to absolutely everything. All the best coffee shops and restaurants, of course. The design is perfect, don't you think, Miss Jones? As you can see, everything has been superbly furnished. I hope it's to your liking and taste, Miss Jones. It's absolutely beautiful. I can't fault it. You may be interested to know... The designer is a young, up-and-coming woman called Sally Pritchett. She has a remarkable way of blending cosiness with glamour together. Not a skill that many designers can boast about. But in her case, she's a natural. So it's been furnished with great attention to detail. I'm sure you will agree. 
with your lifestyle very much taken into account. What do you think, Miss Jones? Is this by any chance an apartment that might tick your boxes, that could be suitable for your immediate needs? I had drawn in a deep breath, taken one more glance at the view, and just said, I'll take it. Mrs. Armstrong clapped her hands together enthusiastically, in the same way my mother would have done when she was triumphant about something, which was an unusual thing to do. I am so delighted, Miss Jones, that you appreciate this apartment as much as I do. I hope you will be very happy here. I moved in a day or so later, and I knew I'd made the right decision, moving into such a comfortable, luxurious apartment block. I really felt as if my life was changing, like a tree that had been struggling to produce blossoms for many years, suddenly unexpectedly bursting into bloom, as if this was now the spring of my life. Things were going so well with Mr. Bridges, and against all the odds, I was beginning to seriously like the man. Why had I thought so badly of him? He had a great sense of humour. My mother was right. He simply demanded perfection, and only sacked people when they were shirking on their responsibilities. But if you made an effort, he rewarded you highly. Obstensively after a hard day's work at the office, nothing was better for me or more welcoming, than returning home to my cosy, comfortable little den. Although there was one major problem. The walls between my apartment to the next were paper-thin, so I could hear a lot of banging and shouting coming from the next-door neighbour's apartment, which increasingly became rather unsettling, based on what I overheard. You stupid, stupid woman! How can you be so bloody dim? Do you actually have a brain in there? Do you realise you've burnt the potatoes? My dinner is ruined. You've cremated the meat. I've been out at work all day. You've been here all this time. The least thing I can expect you to do is to make the house look halfway decent and to have a home-cooked meal when I return. Is that too much to ask of you? You've been swanning around here all day doing absolutely nothing and you can't get the meat right nor the potatoes. The next thing I heard was a mighty bang, as if the man had tossed the roast potatoes and meat all over the floor in his anger. I wouldn't be surprised if that is what he'd done. And look at this! It's a joke! This was a good piece of lamb, but it's shriveled up and so dry. Do you not know how to cook? I can't possibly eat this. I might as well put gravy on a leather boot and be done with that. I'm so sorry, Rog. I was just so exhausted today. I forgot about the roast. I fell asleep. I must have slept through the timer when it went off. You fell asleep? Is that the best you can do? It's a feeble, pathetic excuse. Shame on you. We'll have to order takeout now, because there's no way on God's earth that I'm going to eat this disgusting muck you've produced. Is it too much to ask for a home-cooked meal from time to time? Or can't you even do that properly? The man was shrieking so loudly that my walls began to wobble and tremble from the mere vibration of his voice. I could hear a soft female voice saying, I'm so sorry, Rog, really I am, but the pregnancy is making me so forgetful. I'm tired all the time. I must have fallen asleep. I think it's called pregnancy brain fog. Blame it on your pregnancy all you like. Why don't you? Any excuse in the book and you'll use it to your advantage. I'll have you know, on the very day my mother came out of the hospital after she had delivered me, in the evening she had produced a roasted dinner for my father. And it was faultless. Yet you being pregnant seem to have lost the ability to cook, unless you produce pitiful burnt offerings that are far from appetising. I know, Rog, you've told me the story, but I'm not like your mother. I can't compete with her. I can't even be like her. I just don't have her kind of energy. You're telling me? You're useless. My mother's absolutely efficient. She told me I should never have married you. How right she was. Lazy cow was the word she used to describe you. And guess what? She was right on the money about you. Now get me that takeaway brochure, why don't you? We'll order takeaways. But tomorrow... You better get those potatoes right, because if I live on takeaways, I'll end up looking like one.
I take big pride in my appearance. I work out in the gym a lot, and I don't want to be living like some kind of takeout freak. No, I want decent home-cooked meals. I didn't want to hear any more of this troubling, disquieting conversation. It did not make for pleasant listening. So I tried to drown out the man's voice as he made an order with the pizza delivery company, and by the sounds of things, he was quite demanding. It was as I returned to my apartment the following evening, I observed a woman banging on the next-door apartment, as if she was trying her best to get in. I could clearly see if she was pregnant. She looked up at me nervously, with a glimmer of hope in her eyes. I noticed she had shopping bags in her hand that were weighing her down. She seemed exhausted and fatigued. There were red rims around her eyes, as if she'd been crying. "'You must be my next-door neighbour," I said, rushing hurriedly over to her side. "'Give me that bag. Let me help you. My name is June Jones, by the way. I live next door to you. I've only recently moved in. Can I help you with that shopping? It looks very heavy, and I can see you're pregnant.' The young woman was panting. "'That's kind,' she said breathlessly. I just can't find my front door keys. I'm sure I put them in my purse. I can't find it anywhere. I might have to call a locksmith to let me in. I may have locked myself out. I'm such a dreadful klutz at times. Give me your purse, I said. Let me look through it for you. Keys, in my experience, have a funny habit in slipping behind pockets in purses. It happens to me all the time. But then I do like purses with pockets. I've already looked in there, said the woman, handing me her purse. "'But be my guest. "'If you can find my keys, "'then you'll be my hero for the day. "'At the moment I keep losing everything. "'My memory is like a sieve.' "'I began to sift through the contents "'of the young woman's purse. "'I pulled out a set of keys "'that looked similar to my own, "'so I knew at once, "'given the similarity of the keys, "'that these were probably her apartment keys. "'Are these your keys by any chance?' "'I asked, tinkling them in my hand. "'The young woman's brown eyes brightened.' She looked heartily relieved. The worried expression on her face dissipated, and deep furrows emerged between her brows. "'Where did you get them from?' she asked. "'I turned that purse of mine inside out. "'You must think I'm such an idiot for being so scatty. "'I'm not usually like this, I promise, but at the moment my head is in the clouds.' I grinned. "'They got caught up in the back pocket of your purse, that's all. "'That's why they didn't fall out when you tipped your purse out.' I'm not surprised you didn't find them. That sort of thing happens to me quite a lot. Don't be so hard on yourself. Life is difficult enough already, is it not? Never more hard than at the moment, when I can't seem to do anything right, said the woman. My husband tells me I'm becoming more and more dim each passing day. He's probably right about that. Look at me. I'm a dithering mess. Last night I was looking for my reading glasses. Everywhere I looked. And guess what? They were on my head the whole time. And now my keys were in my purse all along. I'm losing my mind. At the moment I'm forgetting everything. I believe it's known as pregnancy brain. My husband says that that's in my imagination and that there is no such thing. That it's just an excuse. Oh, I know all about pregnancy brain. When my mother's sister's daughter was pregnant, she couldn't remember what day of the week it was let alone what her plans were for the day. I helped the young woman into her apartment with her shopping bags that I placed on the perfect white countertops. I was taken aback by how neat everything was in her apartment, with all the baked beans lined up in a neat row in the cupboards, and everything was in perfect alignment. I'd never seen anything that tidy before. "'You're so tidy!' I said in admiration. "'You should see my cupboards next door, and I've only just moved in.' They're nothing like this. Well, I'm not that tidy, she chuckled. That's my husband Rod, you see. Everything has to be perfect with him. Sometimes when he's not around, I mess the stuff up in the cupboards just to get my revenge on him. But when he returns home, I straighten them out. Let me tell you, he would lose it if things weren't in apple pie order. Oh, I see. So your husband's got OCD, has he? I asked. She rolled her eyes. Is that what they call it? Yes, that's what he's got. I stayed with my next door neighbour while she prepared me a coffee from her fancy coffee machine, while she began peeling potatoes for the roast her husband had demanded for the evening meal. 
It was very pleasant to enjoy a cosy chat with her in the kitchen, and for reasons I cannot comprehend, we seemed to connect, almost as if we'd known each other all our lives. I felt comfortable talking to this woman, as she did to me. "'You must forgive my manners,' she suddenly said. "'I haven't even introduced myself to you. "'My name's Isabella. "'Everybody calls me Izzy.' "'Izzy was an attractive woman. "'Long, dark brown hair, fair skin and a slender physique, "'which made her bump that much more conspicuous. "'My husband's name is Rog, but his real name is Roger. "'No one calls him that, of course. "'For some reason people like to shorten your names, don't they? "'They certainly do with my name, Isabella.' "'Yes, they do,' I agreed. "'But I think Izzy's a pretty name. "'Isabella is also pretty. "'But the shortened version suits you very much. "'How many months pregnant are you, Izzy?' I asked. "'I'm five months pregnant,' she told me, "'stroking her bump affectionately. "'I just can't wait to have this baby. "'I'm so excited about becoming a mother for the first time. "'But at the moment I feel like the walking dead. "'I'm so tired all the time.' "'Rog thinks I'm making all these excuses for my condition "'so that I can do the bare minimum around this apartment, "'but it's not true. "'He doesn't appreciate how exhausting it is "'growing a human being inside of you. "'Tell me about it. "'And on that subject, "'tell me to mind my own business, Izzy, "'but I did overhear the argument your husband had with you last night. "'I'm afraid the walls between our apartments are so thin, "'so I heard it all, I'm afraid.' I wasn't trying to eavesdrop, I promise you that. Your husband was getting his knickers in a twist, throwing quite a tantrum over a roast dinner that you were supposed to cook for him. It sounded as if he was like letting off steam. I couldn't help but think he was being extremely unreasonable towards you. He's not abusive, is he? Izzy flushed. Her face grew a shade of pink. I'm sorry you had to overhear that. It couldn't have been very pleasant for you. My husband's a perfectionist, I'm afraid. That's the trouble. He hates mess of any kind. And, of course, he likes his meals all home-cooked. And I seriously let him down last night, because the roast completely burnt. It was incinerated. I forgot all about it. He was raised by a punctilious mother, you see. One of those unfortunate people that has a perfect house where you would struggle to find a drop of dust anywhere. I mean, how can I compete with that? That mother of his is called Arizona. She was born there. So when her parents didn't know what to call her, they simply called her the name of the state they were living in. Talk about lazy. Roger's mother has OCD badly, just like Rog does. She raised him on home-cooked meals, so my husband expects the exact same standards from me. I'm continually disappointing him. He's just so incredibly demanding, if you know what I mean. He doesn't physically abuse me. He's never raised a hand to me, although sometimes I think he's tempted to do so. But he does feel strongly about not hitting a woman. Anyway, he can be emotionally abusive towards me, as, of course, you probably witnessed last night. Well, emotional abuse is not a good thing, is he, you know, I said. They say sticks and stones can break your bones and words can never harm you. But I don't believe that for a second. "'Yes, I am familiar with the phrase,' Izzy said. "'Well, it's a downright lie,' I continued. "'Words can be very cruel, can't they? "'When you say mean things to people, "'it can destroy their self-esteem and confidence forever. "'My mother's a wellness coach, you know. "'She says words can be deadly weapons, "'and we need to be accountable for what we say to people. "'Have you ever heard of the singer Karen Carpenter? "'She's a long time before our generation.' But she had a spectacular voice. Yes, I know Karen Carpenter. Yes, she's not from our generation. But I've listened to her before, and she's got such an amazing voice. Well, I continued, they say she had the most beautiful female singing voice in the entire world. She died of anorexia nervosa, you know. Someone told her she was fat. It wasn't true, she was probably a little cuddly, but that was it. I mean, talk about words being deadly. "'Is that true?' said Izzy, looking shocked. "'I never knew that. Is that why she died? I'm afraid so. "'My mother believes the Bible when it says one day we'll be accountable for every word we speak. "'Karen Carpenter was never fat, but someone made her so self-conscious about her body that she starved to death. "'Oh, 
that's dreadful," said Izzy, pulling a face. "That really, really sucks. I agree with you about that saying. Sometimes Rog makes me feel so useless and completely incompetent, as if everything I do is pathetic. He keeps comparing me with his mother. I can never compete with her. I don't think anybody can, if I'm telling you the truth. Sometimes he gets so angry, his words can be absolutely cutting. He can undermine me, and since I've been pregnant, he seems to take great pleasure in calling me a lazy slob and a layabout, stuff like that. I can't seem to do anything right in his book, especially at the moment. You're pregnant, for goodness' sake! You're human, I said. You're allowed to slip up from time to time. Your husband Rod should understand that he should be the one looking after you, not the other way round. After all, you're the one that's carrying his baby inside you. If he wants a roast dinner, and you're too exhausted to cook it, then he can cook it himself, can't he? I ordered Isabella to sit down and to lift up her feet while I prepared the roast for her husband. I could see the relief on her face was immense. She was exhausted. Too tired to be on her feet, tending to her husband's every single whim, so I was determined to be there for her. And very soon we became the very best of friends. One day Izzy confided in me about how much she absolutely loathed and abhorred hospitals, and that the only thing that was putting her nerves on edge about her forthcoming baby was having to give birth in a hospital. And I was the first person that could relate to her insecurities in that regard. For I had felt very upset being in a hospital, so I could understand her misgivings. I told her about my wrist operation that I'd had a few years prior, how I desperately struggled to come through my comatose state. She chuckled when I told her about my desire, in my delirium, to purchase a zebra and smuggle it all the way from the continent of Africa. That is hilarious! You must have been given way too much anaesthetic, don't you think? I'm not sure. I don't know how things operate in a hospital, but my mother did overhear two nurses having a conversation together. They gleamed something was awful about me. It might be the reaction to the anaesthesia. I don't know what the problem was, but I know something was wrong, and I never want to go under the knife again. Well, I don't blame you. No wonder you're afraid of hospitals. Doctors do make mistakes, though, don't they? They're human like us," said Izzy. "I have a friend who makes cakes for a living—wedding cakes, you know. She got a last-minute order one day and agreed to make the cake because the customer was so persuasive, very demanding. My friend hates to refuse anyone a request, but she was so overworked and tired at the time, so the last thing she felt like doing was making a cake, which she can usually do standing on her head. Go on," I said. "This is interesting." Well, one day in her haste to get the cake complete, she simply forgot to put the raising agent in it. That hadn't happened to her for years, 'cause she's so professional. But she was in such a blind panic that the cake flopped. Everything went wrong. It was such a waste of expensive ingredients. After that, she learnt to say no to people when they put unreasonable demands on her. So even hardened professionals get it terribly wrong at times, you know. You make a very good point. You're right. I guess it is possible that something could have gone wrong during the surgery. Maybe the anaesthetist himself was tired or overstressed, or it could be, like you were saying, said Izzy, that maybe you personally don't react well to anaesthetics. We are all made so differently, aren't we? What works for one person may not work for another. I mean, I know a friend of mine who went on the carnivore diet. And it was very successful for her. Another friend of mine went on the same diet, and she got fat on it. I mean, how does that work out? I personally hate hospitals myself, and I'm dreading having my baby in one. But do you know you don't have to have a baby in a hospital? I said, if you don't want to. Most people do, but there are other options. Things you can do with the help of a midwife, of course. What do you mean there are other things I can do? What other options? Well, my mother's a wellness coach, isn't she? She had a client once that was absolutely terrified of hospitals, like you are. This woman refused to go near one, if you know what I mean. 
In the end, it was organised for the woman in question to give birth to her baby in a birthing pool, set up in her own home, with a midwife on hand. The woman had her baby delivered in the water. She gave birth naturally to a happy, healthy seven-pound baby boy. She was so delighted to have a natural birth with her husband and midwife at hand. It's not for everyone, of course it's not. It's rather unconventional, but the couple embraced the idea, and for them it worked out swimmingly. I'm not saying it's right for you, of course. You are joking, said Izzy. That sounds absolutely amazing. Oh my goodness, I'd love to give birth like that. I really would. I mean, animals and nature give birth without supervision, don't they? I remember once watching this mother deer giving birth to her doe. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. So effortlessly easy. We make pregnancy so complicated, don't we? I'd love my pregnancy to be as natural as possible, with as little intervention as possible. You would? Yes, I would. You do realize, Izzy, that giving birth is a painful process. Of course I do. I'm not silly. I know it's painful, but that's the whole point. I want to experience it all. Well, I can't say that I agree with you on that one, Izzy. They do say it's a good thing that women forget about the pain after they've been through a delivery, or they might never have a baby again. That's what I've been told. Many women would be absolutely terrified not to be giving birth in a hospital. Your husband will not like the idea. I'm sure of that. I mean, if he's OCD already, making certain every tin in your cupboard is absolutely straight, and that your work surfaces shine within an inch of their life, I can't imagine how he'd react to the mess all over the place after you gave birth. It would probably be a grisly nightmare to him, I imagine. Well, that's too bad, isn't it? Said Izzy, laughing. I don't care about that. Raj doesn't care about me during this pregnancy. I'm the one that is actually carrying this baby, and I can choose how it's going to be born. It's got nothing to do with Raj, as far as I'm concerned. That may be true, but in hospital you'll be safely monitored. They can give you epidurals and stuff like that, can't they, to manage the pain? And if something were to go horribly wrong, which I hope it doesn't. The doctors are at hand to assist in the delivery, because things can happen, you know. Babies can be born breech, stuff like that. You have to prepare for every eventuality, don't you? Well, not really. I think everything's going to be fine if I give birth in a birthing pool. It sounds absolutely amazing. I can't imagine anything going wrong. Think about it very carefully, Izzy, before you jump into anything too impulsively. A birthing pool is going to be a very natural birthing process. The midwife will be there to help you with the delivery, I dare say. But with that kind of arrangement, you'll have to have the approval of your gynaecologist, if you want to go down that route. I mean, and it's certainly not for everyone. Some people might find the idea of giving birth at home in a birthing pool quite horrifying, especially if it gets painful. I wouldn't do it myself if I were you. Because I'm not that brave, Izzy looked at me with bright eyes. I told you, I don't care about the pain, not at all. I want to feel every single twinge. It's going to make me feel so alive. I don't care. That pain is an important part of the birthing process. It'll make the experience all the more real, all the more worthwhile for me. And as for the mess. Well, Rog cannot expect a birth to be a clean experience, can he? He'll be delusional if he thinks that. There's going to be blood and placenta all over the place, and he's going to have to deal with it. Well, talk about your birthing options with the professionals. I said, "That's all I'm saying, Izzy. You've got your choices, but you don't have to do everything by the book." Izzy looked at me reflectively, as I keep saying to you, "This is my baby." How I deliver him is up to me, not up to Rog at all. It's my decision, and it's nice to be able to make the decision for myself this time. I'm the mother. If Rog was giving birth to the baby, I'd have to respect his decision on where he chose to have it, whether I liked it or not. It's just the way it is. I had never seen Izzy look so resolutely determined before. She was quite subservient as far as her husband was concerned. 
always apologising for her blunders, but on this matter of giving birth it seemed she was firmly anchored into making her own decisions. I had a horrible sense of prognostication that my suggestion about giving birth in this unconventional way would one day come back to bite me, and in some way it would seem my gut instincts were proved correct. The following morning who should be standing at my front door but Izzy's formidable husband, Rog himself. No prizes for guessing why he'd paid me such an impromptu visit. I should have guessed this would happen. I'd met the man once before, and never particularly warmed to him, as he'd been rather aloof towards me, and only tolerated me because I was his wife's new friend. "'Oh, you're our neighbour, are you?' he had said. I had tried to be friendly towards him, but he'd been very brusque towards me and pretty much ignored me most of the time. On this rather nonchalant Saturday morning, when I was looking forward to spending the day, having a leisurely stroll around the shops and buying myself an item of clothing from a boutique called Dreamboat, where I'd been given a gift certificate from Mr. Bridges for my birthday, perhaps I would enjoy having coffee on the go and a nice snack at the smoking rib, which did the most delectable toasted cheese I'd ever tasted. Rog stood on the other side of my door, glaring at me furiously like a formidable wild animal that would like to get its sharp claws into my jugular and tear me apart, if given the chance. I don't mind admitting that my heart began to flutter very nervously in my chest. I'm not normally predisposed to being intimidated by people, apart from Mr. Bridges at work, but Rog was a big man, built like some of those very tall men you get from Scandinavian countries. It was clear that he worked out tirelessly in the gym, to get as shredded as possible. He had massive biceps that were so tight they could practically crack walnuts. He had tattoos on his arms of snakes and dragons, and that for me personally was rather sinister. But I dare say a lot of people would say that was pretty cool. There were the words, Power is in my hands, written across his lower arm. This man really did fancy himself, I thought. The most intimidating thing about Rog was, of course, his sheer size. He could have been six foot five, so he was incredibly tall, and suddenly I felt conspicuously small, by contrast. He looked down at me with a visible hatred in his eyes that was quite palpable. If that man could have spit on me, he probably would have done so. He was so contemptuous towards me. I tried to ask myself whether I could consider Rog handsome, if he didn't have such an obnoxious, unendearing personality. In truth, I'm not sure whether I would have, as the inside does have a nasty habit of showing up on the outside veneer, even if you try desperately to hide it. If I saw him in passing along the street, would I say he was good-looking, in a Germanic sort of way? Maybe. He had the stereotype Scandinavian good looks, with the blonde wavy hair, blue eyes and golden complexion. His jawline was square, which a lot of women I dare say would find rather attractive, as it accentuates his all-around masculinity, I suspect. But for me personally, masculinity starts from the inside out, not the outside in. There was a vague Brad Pitt look about him, you could say, but any attractiveness he might have possessed was cruelly robbed by the formidable look he chose to give me. In that moment he scared me half to death, and I'm not ashamed to admit this. I would have happily slammed the door in his face if given the chance but that would be incredibly rude, given he was my next-door neighbour, and besides that, the husband of my new best friend. He quickly put his foot forward in the doorway, as if anticipating what I was about to do, and abruptly pushed past me, walking brazenly into my apartment, with a presumptuousness that took my breath away. I couldn't believe his shameful audacity, but it was very clear that Rog did not have any social graces. "'I see you're getting all nice and cosy with my Izzy,' he said, poking his finger at me accusingly. "'I don't mind you being a friend of my wife's, because it's good for her to have girlfriends. At least I thought it was. But you are not a good influence on her. My wife has changed hanging around with the likes of you. It's like she's become a wild mare that needs to be broken in. You've crossed the line here.' How dare you go filling my wife's head with these crazy nonsensical ideas? What are you? A new age freak? Some kind of hippie? No, I'm not a hippie. 
I don't know why you would say such a thing. Nor am I new age. Far from that, in fact. Well, you sound like a hippie. What's all this stuff and nonsense about a birthing pool and a midwife at hand to supervise my wife giving birth in our apartment, for God's sake? Who in their right mind does that? She's planning to make all these arrangements for a ridiculous delivery because you put this absurd idea into her head. And I blame you for this. I'm not going to forget this in a hurry, let me tell you. Look, I didn't put any idea into Izzy's head, I said defensively. Izzy and I are good friends, but she's got a mind of her own and is perfectly capable of making her own decisions without my influence. You could kid me. And you call yourself a friend, do you? When you suggest that my baby should be born in a birthing pool in our apartment? Are you completely insane? This is my baby we're talking about. And it's Izzy's as well, not just yours. Look, Izzy's a little apprehensive about giving birth in a hospital, that's all. I told her there were other ways to deliver her baby. That she didn't have to give birth in a hospital if she didn't want to. That she could make alternative arrangements. That's all I said to her. What is wrong with you, woman? You're lucky you're female. I'd bloody clobber you if given half the chance. Honestly, my wife is fixated about this nonsensical, ridiculous, insane idea. And there is nothing I can do to change her mind. I had a funny feeling about you. The first moment I laid eyes on you, I knew you were not good news. And it seems I was right about you. I'm very upset about this plan of my wife's. And it's all your fault. It's your influence over her. Look, I'll do my best to talk to Izzy for you. I'll try and persuade her to change her mind about the birthing pool. But you know she can be very stubborn about things. You better talk to her long and hard, woman. Knock some sense into that head of hers. Ever since she's been pregnant, she's gone all dithery on me. And now she's dreaming about having her baby in our apartment. She's already going to order that damn birthing pool. Don't be hard on her. You should be looking after her during this special time. She needs your support, Rog, while the baby is growing inside her. Pregnancy can be very tough on a woman, you know. What do you think I'm doing, you stupid, stupid woman? I do nothing but look after my wife. I want her to have her baby in the hospital, like a normal person. But no, you come along and fill my wife's head with marshmallow ideas. You've got her all excited about this own natural nonsense. Never heard anything more ridiculous in my entire life. Have you stopped to consider my wife might actually need pain management? She might need an epidural or something like that. And what if things go wrong and there is no doctor on hand to help her in the delivery? If anything happens to my baby, anything happens to it, it'll be your fault. Look! I want to support Izzy in any way I can, I said. I've warned her about the potential problems and hazards of having a baby at home. But she's not concerned about those things. And Izzy feels sure her gynaecologist will be fine about the whole thing, given her pregnancy is going so smoothly. That's because my wife goes to a female gynaecologist that is woo-woo, much like you and my wife are. Izzy needs your support, young lady, like a hole in the head. You are no friend to her. You're like an annoying wasp buzzing around a can of sweet Coca-Cola. I don't know what my wife ever saw in you. I don't know where the likes of you come from. But you're not from around here. People around here conduct themselves in a civilised way, I'll have you know. I wish to God you hadn't moved in next door to us. He furiously stomped out of my apartment and banged the front door behind him, so fiercely that I jumped out of my skin. It took a while for me to calm down, and my Saturday morning was ruined as the idea of shopping and picking up coffee had lost its sweet allure, and not even the thought of a melted toasted cheese could drag me away from my apartment. I felt miserable for the rest of the day, feeling great regret for having wound up my very aggressive next-door neighbour. It left me with an uneasy, disquieted feeling. 
that coiled its way obtrusively around my gut, like a slithering snake. One thing was for certain, I didn't like Rog at all. He was a menacing man. What on earth did Izzy see in the likes of him? She was a kind and gentle spirit, while he was menaciously ruthless and dogmatic. But I did clandestinely admire her for standing up to him on how she wanted to deliver her baby. Good on her, I thought, for not letting him lay down the law, which normally happened in their household. It was about time Rog was put in his place. So there we are. That is the end of part two. Part three is tomorrow night. I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night. <laughs>